Boat Electrical Made Easy Part 5B and we'll be doing some diagnostics in this one. Let's get straight to it but watch the other videos first or it won't make sense. So let's have a look at measuring DC amps but first I think I should explain to you that um, there's two different ways of measuring with a meter. So let's look at our nearly flat 9 volt battery. If we're going to measure voltage we would put our black lead in the common and our red in the volts, ohms and amps up to 200 milliamps. We turn our voltage selector we're expecting up to 9 volts so that falls on the 0 to 20 scale for DC. I'm now going to measure the voltage. Now when you measure voltage you need to measure in parallel to the battery. I'll put a little, uh, a little diagram in the video to sh explain to you what parallel is. And here we're measuring 3.34 volts. We've got our little line in front, in front of the reading and so we know that we have the positive and negative round the wrong way measure again the little line disappears and there we go so we're measuring parallel the cables are paralleled to the battery so whenever you're measuring voltage you measure in parallel so here's our little wired circuit that we made up from last time and we're now going to measure um, we're now going to measure how many amps this circuit is drawing so I'll just assemble it so in order to measure the current that's flowing through this circuit we need to put the meter in series the current will flow through the leads and through the meter now this is important if you're measuring up to 10 amps with this meter that's fine the, the protection sorry the protection circuitry in here and the fuses uh, mean that this uh, piece of equipment can cope with that if I was to measure more than 10 amps it's likely I would blow the fuse or damage the meter so using our meter we need to connect that meter in series in part of this circuit here so the current is flowing this way and we want to measure how much current is flowing in this circuit so we take our little 9 volt battery again and what we do is we connect our meter in that circuit so it becomes part of the circuit as shown in the diagram. So in this drawing you can see that the current is actually flowing through the meter. This is called in series. Now this little LED bulb is going to be drawing milliamps so we don't need to change our common negative terminal. So remember from the last video the black is common and the red lead is always the one you change to the higher amperage terminal. So if we were measuring 3, 5, 7 or 8 amps we change the red lead to the 10 amp terminal. That lead over to the bigger scale setting. So let's have a look. We turn our meter onto milliamps. It's now set 0 to 200 milliamps. And I'll just connect these with crop clips for now. Just to illustrate and we'll measure what we've got. So we're measuring about one point six, one point five milliamps in that circuit. And you'll note that the red light is on. And that's because the current is now flowing from the positive 
through the fuse, through the switch, through the LED lamp, out of the LED lamp, through our meter and then back to the battery. So when we measure amperage, we measure that amperage with the meter in the circuit in series. Now the exception to this is when you use one of these clamp meters. With a clamp meter it works by induction. Remember we talked about how cables have magnetism running in them when they're live? This is an AC clamp meter but you can buy DC clamp meters and they work in the same way. They're not part of the circuit. The electromagnetic induction induces a current in a coil and that current is measured on the scale here. I believe that's a much safer way of measuring current rather than putting your uh, meters into a circuit. So just to recap, voltage is measured in parallel as per this diagram and amperage is measured in series with your meter in series unless you have an AC or DC clamp meter where they measure by inductive force. So there's three things I usually get asked to have a look at. The first failure is usually a start motor where an engine won't start. The second is batteries and the third thing is charging alternators and solar but we'll get on to them. Let's look at the starter motor first. So this is a typical small engine diesel starter motor. This one's off a of Yanmar and I'm pointing at the solenoid. The solenoid is like a relay. This is the main body of the motor. It's just an electric motor. This one has four sets of brushes inside it. It works the same way as the uh, as your windlass. This is the main positive feed from the battery bank. And this one is the positive feed from the solenoid into the starter motor. And this tab, this is the positive feed from your key switch or from your start button. Let's explain. OK, this is a simple circuit for a starter motor. Now don't panic, there's actually two circuits here. When you push the button or turn the start key, this switch closes. It energises the circuit and power is supplied to the solenoid. The solenoid then closes, pushing these connectors down and closing the second circuit before the current travels back to the battery. Now the second circuit is in bigger cable. When the solenoid closes, it allows a high amperage current to the starter motor and then back to the battery. Ah, So just like a relay, the solenoid and the two circuits work together. A small current switches the solenoid which allows a big current to flow to the motor. OK, so where was the negative pins on the starter motor you ask? Well, this is the same circuit diagram. However, on most small marine diesels, the negative side of the battery is the engine. The engine's connected directly to it, so anything you connect to the engine gets a negative. This means if you want to pick up a return to the battery, you simply connect something to the engine, and that's your return path. Therefore, the circuit diagram doesn't need to show the return paths. Make sense? Now on bigger engines still, the solenoid can actually take quite a high current. So what they do is they use a relay to switch the solenoid to switch the motor. So this is exactly the same principle circuit diagram, except there are three circuits here. Just take a few moments to see what happens. We close the start switch or key switch or push button, 
that energises the relay, which energises the solenoid, which energises the motor. All of the return paths are back through the motor or engine. So actually what you're doing is using multiple circuits in order to allow a huge current to a big start motor on a big, bigger engine. It's a bit like those Russian dolls, you know, one inside the other. So for the starter to actually turn, all of these components and connections must be working. So here's a tip. The most frequent breakdown that I see is the failure of this terminal here. The symptoms of this terminal being badly corroded are that the engine won't start or that there's a flat battery when actually it's just a terminal. It's usually insulated in plastic and covered up. Now this big positive terminal on the other hand isn't usually covered up and when it gets the green death people see that it's corroded and needs sorting. They never see the little one. Before we left the UK a friend of ours asked if I'd come and look at his starter. He said he'd bought a new battery and the starter motor still wasn't working and he couldn't work out why. He'd spent £95 on a new battery when actually he needed to spend just a few pennies on a new crimp terminal to the back of the solenoid. Now here's another tip or trick. If you think the starter motor's solenoid isn't working you can actually short it out. There'll be a few sparks and you shouldn't do it regularly but it will get you out of trouble when your engine won't start and either the trigger circuit isn't working or the solenoid has failed. It's a get your home job only. So shorting out these two terminals will bypass the solenoid and engage the starter motor. Take a large screwdriver or a big spanner and simply short the two out. The starter motor will engage and hopefully your engine will start. You can then get back to port and sort it when you get there. There is just one thing. You need to have your ignition on when you do this because some modern diesel engines have a solenoid on the fuel pump and that needs to be open. So ignition on, short out the terminals. So let's go back to our simple starter motor and solenoid circuit diagram. Let's look at where we would test and how we would test to see if the solenoid is energising or working or getting a voltage to it. And there's a return path of course. Let's start at the beginning. So in this diagram we're testing for voltage and remember what we said when testing for voltage we need to be in parallel with the battery. So the red lead from our multimeter is going to the positive terminal and our black lead, the common lead, is going to the negative terminal. When the starter switch or key switch is pushed, or push button start, then it will energize the solenoid. So we should get a voltage around about 12.7 volts, maybe a little more. When the solenoid closes, you should also get a voltage supply to the starter motor on the positive. So just swap the lead over and see if you're getting voltage on the high current side of the solenoid, just here. If you're getting voltage on the low current side of the solenoid, the solenoid is clicking closed and you're not getting voltage on the high current circuit, then the contacts within the solenoid are dirty or worn. If you're not getting voltage on the low current side of the solenoid, then you need to trace that fault, just like we did with the small circuit I made up, and you'll probably find it's a connector, like the one I've shown you on the back of the starter motor. But it can often be the key switch or starter button, something else you need to check. Simply changing your positive detection lead from your meter from one side of the solenoid, positive, to the other side will also tell you if the current's getting through when the start button or key switch circuit is closed. Does that make sense? Well the video's now up to 14 and a half, nearly 15 minutes and we've just started explaining the very basics of uh, some of the problems that we found over the years on our boats and other people's boats and, and we really want to try and help you out to find these things quickly and build on our experience. Um, we don't always find faults the first time um, and it's all a learning curve so don't think that we know it all, we certainly don't. 
But what we're trying to do is pass on the knowledge that we have gained to you guys uh, so that you can build on that. Now, we're going to look at more starter motor issues uh, in the next video. Um, and then we'll probably look at alternators and batteries and charging and even an in-depth look at solar. So I hope you've enjoyed the, the videos. We certainly enjoyed putting them together, Cindy and I. Cindy's actually back in the UK at the moment, so uh, I've been a bit uh, busy walking dogs and doing other things to uh, get the video. So I'm sorry it took so long to get out. Thanks again for watching. Uh, and if you like, don't forget, hit that subscribe button. Uh, it's down there somewhere and uh, hit the bell as well and you'll get a notification when one of our videos comes up. I'm going to continue this afternoon uh, helping David out next door, he's actually got a battery problem and then I'll be making the next tourist video uh, you know, of our trip. We've got so much footage in the can and there's a really great place that we went to on the Italian islands. So thanks for watching guys, don't forget like, subscribe and comment and give us a thumbs up, it really helps. Bye for now.